Um, today I'm, I'm going to give a, a bird's view, uh, a bit of macro view on uh, some of the research that we have been doing uh, at GAN, some of which uh, Dennis was involved. Um, you will see that a lot of that research in line with the tradition in uh, psycholinguistics of bilingualism was about uh, some pretty um, basic uh, lexical stuff. Uh, and that's also the field where most of my initial research was situated in. So uh, you can see in the title that uh, there will be a big emphasis uh, on uh, lexical interactions. Uh, I will start with the part about uh, the visual word recognition studies that we've done. Um, and you will see that basically we carried out exactly the same experiments in the uh, auditory modality. Uh, so that will allow me to go quite uh, quickly there. And I will also, if there's time, I doubt it, but if there's time, um, I will end with one experiment uh, in the new field that we are developing, uh, which is the field of language control. Please um, don't hesitate to ask questions or interrupt if something is not clear. Um, first, let me say a little bit, uh, a little word about what is already known about bilingual word recognition. I understood from them is that there are not a lot of people uh, doing bilingualism uh, here in the room. So, um, again, please shout if something is not clear. Um, to begin this section, I think it's clear to point out that the field of bilingualism is actually uh, a very young field and that most of the research, uh, and if I would have to estimate it, it would be like 70 or 80 percent, uh, has been about one question. Uh, and that question is about uh, the autonomy of the two language uh, systems. So is it the case that we have two separate uh, systems for each of the languages that uh, we know? Uh, and estimates now say that about half of the world population is bilingual. I know that in the UK that's a little bit less. Uh, but in the world, uh, it's not that rare. Uh, and so most research has focused on the question, do we handle these languages with one system, uh, with, with two separate systems, or instead is it one integrated uh, system? And basically the field took off with uh, big names like Tom Dijkstra, for instance, uh, from Nijmegen, who has done a lot of work uh, about that. And um, the typical question that you will find in the literature there is that, uh, in the very beginning, people were trying to find out, is it the case that if you read, uh, because visual word recognition was actually, I guess, also 70 or 80 percent uh, of the psycholinguistic literature in bilingualism was about visual word recognition. And so within that literature, uh, I think about half of the studies uh, will have tackled uh, this question, is it the case if you read in a second language or in a third language? Uh, is it the case that your native language, so your L1, is active when you're reading in that second language? <coughs> and a typical study there is one of Lemmehoeffer and Tom Dijkstra and others from 2004, in which they show that if you do a lexical decision part, so you have to decide whether a letter string is a word or it isn't a word, and you do that in your second language or in your third language, people are faster to recognize uh, cognates that are words um, that are existing letter strings, not only in the second or in the third language, but also in the native language. So uh, an example for a Dutch English bilingual would be banan, banana. So it doesn't need to be really identical words, but similar words. Well, uh, if you ask bilinguals to recognize banana in English, which is L2 uh, for a Dutch English bilingual, so they will recognize that faster than a control <coughs> word. And a typical <coughs> explanation, and there are also computational models that model that effect. Uh, a typical explanation is that uh, the letter string also uh, causes activation in the lexical representations of your mother language and uh, of course because of the similarity between the two there will be facilitation, spreading of activation and you will recognize faster. Yeah? This is what we call the cognitive facilitation effect. That's important because it is also the effect that we studied in our eye tracking studies that I will be uh, talking about later. Um, Lemmer, Huffer and colleagues show that it's not only an effect that you observe in your L2, in your second language, but you can also get it in your L3. Um, if you look at the word in your third language, which is a cognate, um, you will um, recognize it faster um, if it's a cognate with your L1 than a simple L3 control word. And if it's a cognate across three languages, you will even be 
uh, quicker, right? So the activation spreading is cumulative across languages. So the explanation there is that you get activation in lexical representations of the three languages, and uh, these representations will facilitate each other, and so you will be faster to read. Um, you will say, well, no big deal. Uh, Can I ask a very naive question? Yeah. Brain imaging studies, mm -hmm. when you say several, several languages, Well, evidence there is a bit is a bit mixed. I actually reviewed that literature, the neuroimaging literature, um, for a grant proposal <laughs> last month, and then I looked at the literature, and uh, there will be a, about 20 neuroimaging studies uh, with reading and production tasks uh, in L1 and in L2, and they will compare neural activation. And about 70 or 80 percent of the neuroimaging studies claims that it's exactly the same neural structure. Yeah. And then there are some other studies which are a bit more refined and who will say, yeah, it's the same area, but it's a different population of neurons. But if I would have to give one answer, it would be, yes, it's in the same okay. brain. And um, because of those studies and also because of these studies, people say, well, yeah, of course, maybe it's plausible that you can't shut off your native language when you're reading in your second language. But is it also the other way around? So, uh, if you, uh, if your native language is English and you are reading an English newspaper, is it also the case that uh, the Dutch or the Spanish or the Arabic that you know, uh, does it also get activated? And that's maybe a bit more surprising, but that's exactly what has been found in this literature. Again, this is a study which comes from the Dave Strauss group. And they did a first language lexical decision task. So this task only contains words from the native language. Uh, you only have to react uh, to English words uh, if you're an English native speaker. And again, also there, uh, a cognitive facilitation effect has been found. So for a Dutch English bilingual, uh, people will be faster to recognize, to read the word banaan, because in their second language, in their English, which is not relevant for the experiment at that time, banana is also a word. And in French, it's also a cognate. So for Dutch, English, French trilinguals, uh, as Dennis says, uh, that would be a word that is uh, recognized um, very quickly. Yeah. Uh, so from this literature, I, I only pointed out two studies, but there are a bunch of studies. And as I say, most of the research in bilingualism has actually uh, done this over and over again. And when we started this research, we said, well, OK, there's cross-lingual lexical interactions, uh, interactions during L2 and also L1 reading, uh, which supports a strong aselective model of lexical access. So both languages are always active at the same time, are also functionally interactive. Uh, but I had a problem with that, and that's the gra basically grain science uh, problem. All of these studies, and I'm, re I'm really talking about the majority of the bilingual studies at that time, I'm talking 2004, 2005, uh, they all studied uh, word recognition in isolation, but as we know, people of course read words uh, mostly uh, in other contexts than, than in a lexical decision task. Uh, uh, so we wondered what about normal bilingual reading as it happens um, in everyday life, what about sentences? And basically, um, why is that relevant? Well, of course, from monolingual research, we know that there are a bunch of contextual factors. Uh, which guide lexical access uh, when reading in a native language. Those can be semantic uh, constraints, those can be lexical or syntactic constraints. You expect there to be a noun, so you will be faster to process uh, nouns, for instance. And so we wondered, well, maybe uh, all these indications that both languages of bilingual are always active are just an artifact of the fact that people are just doing a lexical decision task and they are seeing words out of context. And uh, even though it's an experiment in English or in Dutch, uh, they still only get one word at a time, and maybe the lexical system doesn't know which language it's going to get, and so it keeps both languages active. So we wondered, uh, would it be the case, if you look at sentence reading, uh, would it be the case um, that bilingual readers actually use the, la the language of words appearing in a sentence as a cue to guide lexical search of words appearing in that will, of course, be a very efficient cue because if you're reading the newspaper in English, you basically know that all the words that you're going to have to recognize will be English words. So if you could shut off your Dutch lexicon, it 
will save you uh, almost 50% of the lexical representations for lexical search. So that would be a very economic, um, uh, economic um, system. But nobody had done it, and basically when, at first we did this study in 2007, together with Dennis, by the way, uh, this, this was the first uh, sentence reading study uh, in the field of bilingualism. Uh, all the other studies had done visual word recognition, and more specifically visual word recognition uh, in isolation. So uh, this is basically the first L2 uh, reading study. I will um, give another example, which was a bit earlier later. Um, and basically we started out with the replication of the L2 cognitive facilitation effect. So we had people reading in that second language, and we saw um, or we investigated or people quicker uh, to recognize words that are also uh, lexical representations in their native language. In this experiment we had eight identical cognates like the word lip which is lep in Dutch. Um, so written exactly the same, it's form identical and we also had 22 near cognates like the word uh, ship which is schep in Dutch. Uh, here we had a sentence reading task uh, but it's not actually um, a real sentence reading study in the sense that we also investigated syntactic structure and stuff like that. No, we were merely interested uh, in visual word recognition of targets embedded in a sentence context. Yes. I just wonder, how do you define a near um, I will, um, I will go into that a bit later. We had a measure uh, for that. Uh, but it will be more relevant uh, later on when we did continuous analysis. Uh, here, basically, in this study, we just picked up uh, um, non-identical cognates from earlier studies in isolation. But you're right, there isn't a strict criterion about that. Yeah? So we allow, uh, I think, here the criterion was that we allow two letters difference. Uh, but of course, in some words, that gets a bigger difference in phonology than in, than in other words. But I think here it was two letters. But I will say something more about that later on when I will use a continuous measure of cross-lingual uh, overlap. Um, so here we had this kind uh, of stimuli and people were uh, seated in an eye tracker and they saw sentences like the waiter bought uh, um, and then basically two words could follow, the near cognate, uh, which in this case was ship, or the control word farm, so it was matched uh, on length, letter, bigram frequency, word frequency, syntactic class, uh, everything that we could uh, think of. You can also see that both words actually fitted the sentence, at least at that point, uh, to, to an equal extent. So uh, we did a close probability uh, study <coughs> and uh, it wasn't the case that one of the words was more plausible in the sentence context uh, than the other words. Uh, there was no lexical decision task here, so which was already something new uh, for this literature, just natural reading. Uh, these are all late, unbalanced Dutch-English bilinguals, as I am, uh, and by now you will have noticed that that doesn't uh, entail a uh, perfect uh, uh, bilingualism. So I think I started learning English at school, what would it have, uh, I think around age 15, uh, something like that. So that's our typical uh, bilingual uh, participant in this study. So these are people who are uh, immersed, who get a lot of English, I think I of course, I'm a scientist, so my English frequency will be a bit higher, but for our students, it's about 5% uh, about of the time, I would estimate. Um, and they were seated in an eye uh, tracker, uh, which is familiar uh, to you, I guess. The experiments of uh, this study, I won't go into uh, all that much uh, details, but the important fact, of course, uh, effect, of course, is here. Uh, we observed uh, short the first fixed uh, duration, but also base duration and cumulative uh, region reading times for identical cognates compared to controls, and that was actually a very big effect. It was almost a 30 minute second effect. Uh, but not for non-identical cognates. Yeah. So here we got a hint in the CRRT uh, times, but uh, which uh, was a numerical uh, trend, but it was never uh, significant. Um, so that shows that, uh, at least for identical cognates, when people were reading in their second language, uh, uh, the first language got active to the same, uh, got active to a certain extent. Yes, I just call it for the people who wonder what CRRT is. It's um, at the beginning, when GoPost time, 
here there were actually multiple names and group of time what it at that time, but occasionally you can see CRRT, but it's the same group of time. Oh, okay. yeah. So that basically means that the coconuts, uh, the non identical coconuts, will be fixated uh, less than the coconuts. But it was that was um, By then we had learned a lot. That was uh, actually, I think, my first eye tracking uh, study. Uh, supervision of Dennis and then we said well let's take it a little bit further and let's do this in uh, L1 uh, what happens if people are reading a newspaper in their native language then can you still find traces of uh, knowledge of an L2 of English uh, when they are reading and in this study and this study was actually never published um, we use the same cognates near cognates we never published this because we re we re ran it with a bigger number of stimuli you will see uh, uh, but we also did it with the same materials, uh, but these time the cognates, so uh, again, uh, the Dutch equivalent of the cognate ship that I just talked about, which was then Schep, uh, we embedded it in uh, a native language uh, sentence. We had the same 30 critical uh, stimuli. We searched for new first language controls. The sentences were more or less uh, translations. Again, no lexical decision paths, just reading. And again, we embedded the, sent the targets in the sentences, and in Dutch, then uh, this sounds like the Oberbochten Schep, uh, then the control word uh, becomes Wagen, which is now five letters, not four, uh, four letters in the L2 experiment. Uh, and it helped that he had woman with the money that he had won. So remember, these are Dutch English bilinguals reading in Dutch, right? But even then, it was the case that on first fix, um, we got a significant effect, and I think it was also significant here, but not on the age duration. But even then it was the case that on first fix, cognates were recognized faster than control. So these are Dutch English bilinguals reading a Dutch newspaper, uh, and still, if something is a word also in English, which uh, they know, uh, they are faster to recognize it. This is also the first time by then LMEs had uh, started appearing in the field. That wasn't the case in the first studies uh, that we did. And uh, here we were a bit troubled by the fact that we couldn't get the effect with the non-identical cognates. And also, as uh, the lady pointed out, there, all, there also isn't a very clear definition in the literature of uh, what is a near cognate. And at that time we decided um, to uh, use an existing measure of cross-lingual overlap, uh, a measure developed by Guy van Orden, um, which basically is just a, a raw measure of uh, the similarity across languages between translation and equivalence. So for uh, the cognate hotel, hotel uh, overlap is perfect, would be uh, a one, and for book, book, it would be 0.72. For scarf, uh, shawl, some letters are shared, but not much. Um, and of course, for translation equivalence that are in cognates, uh, the number gets really close to zero. Um, at that time, we used linear mixed effects models for the first time, and here you see the graphs in which uh, we analyzed first fixation durations, gauge duration, and CRRTs as a function not longer of uh, identical cognates versus controls and non identical cognates versus controls, but as a measure of cross lingual overlap. And I see that on this graph the raw data points are actually missing, but if we ran this analysis, we actually got a, a very strong, uh, significant, linear trend of cross-lingual overlap. So that means people were faster to recognize these native language words as a function of the similarity of that word with the translation equivalent in the second language, which was English, but not relevant for the Dutch reading experiment at that time. Okay. Um, so, that was actually a very exciting effect for us, so, uh, but we were still a bit worried about the fact that we only had eight identical cognates. Uh, so we also re-ran the study with a bigger uh, amount of cognates and also uh, because by then we were using LMEs, we tried to have the full range uh, of cross-lingual overlap and not uh, the old dichotomy that we had in there because of the old factorial experiment. So basically, we replicated this also with 30 different L1 critical uh, stimuli. We manipulated cross-lingual overlap continuously. We embedded the targets in sentences. These were, again, no constraint sentences, which uh, look like then found not often uh, or drawer, or then be the control word among the rubbish in the 
Um, this is the result of this replication study. Actually, again, here you see first fixed gauge deviation and we see our RTs. Again, we found a strong, uh, well, strong, the effect size is not that huge, but uh, it was highly significant, uh, threat of cross label overcome. Um, in the next study, we decided, well, okay, um, um, by now, we've done the first uh, bilingual sentence reading studies, but uh, we only uh, tested low constraint sentences. So what happens uh, if uh, you would have real sentences, which may actually uh, very often constrain towards uh, given semantic interpretation? So in this uh, study, uh, everything was very similar with respect to or in comparison with the previous studies. This was again an L2. Uh, reading study, but this time we manipulated the semantic constraint of the sentence, which means which means uh, here the cognate was uh, shu, which is schun in Dutch, so this is not an identical uh, cognate. And this cognate was embedded in a high constraint sentence, like the little cat scratched. Uh, no, this is the low constraint sentence, like the little cat scratched the letter on this, and basically any word could follow. Uh, on the shoe last evening, and then the high constraint sentence would, would have been uh, a bubble bump got stuck on the, stole, on the sole of his shoe last evening. Um, we expected, well, okay, low constraint sentences, the lexical system has to keep all lexical possibilities open, so there we expected a replication of the cognitive facilitation effect, and that's indeed what we found. Here you see the dichotomous uh, effect. I will show uh, the LMEs uh, on the next slide. Um, but to our surprise, also in the high constraint sentence, so even if the sentence strongly biases towards uh, a given lexical representation, in this case, uh, shu, uh, we observed an equally large cognitive effect. Here again, you see the LMEs uh, with the raw data points uh, included. Again, we found a continuous overlap, <coughs> uh, a significant effect of a continuous overlap measured. So, for this visual word recognition uh, studies, basically in these first um, uh, sentence studies in the field of bilingualism, uh, we replicated the cognitive facilitation effect, even the targets appearing in a sentence context. So that means that uh, readers do not use the language of a sentence of the materials that they are getting in as a cue to guide or to restrict lexical access towards um, a single lexicon. Um, we even got this effect in native language reading, so even if uh, your native language is English and your second language is Spanish, uh, reading uh, the times uh, will be different just because you know uh, Spanish and your word recognition times will be influenced uh, by the cross-lingual overlap with the Spanish translation equivalents of the words uh, that you're reading. So we need to do L1 readers, uh, and we even found this effect in high constraint sentences. So, that concludes the visual studies. Uh, I think I will have time uh, to also complete the auditory studies by now. Why would it matter? Um, when we uh, completed this set of studies, we always got the same effect. And of course, we got a bit uh, bored of it. You get the cognitive facilitation effect. You get it every time, even with constraint sentences. Uh, but when we looked at the literature, as I pointed out earlier, we noticed that about 80% of the available uh, bilingual research was actually research in visual word recognition which is, of course, much easier to do because it's easier to present stimuli and to go to responses. And there was very few research in auditory uh, bilingual word recognition in contrast, of course, with the monolingual domain in which auditory word recognition is also a very uh, big field. Why would it matter with respect to the selectivity, to the language selectivity of word recognition? Well, there's a very clear difference. Script, of course, is language neutral least for languages that share the same alphabet. Things uh, start to be far when, when you're speaking about Hebrew or uh, Arabic. But for instance, for Dutch and English, uh, if you see a word, uh, the stimulus itself doesn't contain any information with respect to the language to which the lexical representation belongs. In the auditory domain, that is different. Spoken language contains many language-specific phonemes and allophonic uh, variations, which gives away the language of the stimulus that you need to comprehend. If I'm speaking English, I think it's very clear that I have a Belgian 
uh, accent. So that's information in the auditory uh, signal that your recognition system uh, actually can use um, to tune the lexical system. In this case, it would be very misleading because you get Belgian input and still you have to do recognition in English. But uh, if I'm in Belgium, uh, my Belgian accent uh, could be used to tune uh, the system towards recognition of Dutch. Uh, there is actually uh, little research, uh, but there is research which shows that people actually use these kind of cues. Uh, for example, Francois Grosjean uh, showed already in 1988 that people are able to judge the language membership of spoken words, of produced words, just on the basis of the initial phoneme. So uh, in that experiment, they just cut out words from a, a speech stream, and they only retained uh, the first uh, milliseconds uh, of the utterance. And people are actually able uh, to judge the language of the word uh, that was actually pronounced just on the basis of uh, very little uh, information. So again, here we wondered, maybe that's also used as an efficient cue to restrict lexical search to uh, a single lexicon. Uh, at that time, um, a few studies were done, and the hallmark study here is one of Fiorica, Mayen, and colleagues which used the visual word paradigm. Uh, so the different than the eye tracking studies that I just talked about. And in this paradigm, Russian English bilinguals in Russia, so living in the States, were asked uh, to pick up the marker. Right? And they had a uh, display here, and their eye movements were tracked. And what Marian and colleagues observed is that when Russian English bilinguals were asked to pick up the marker, that they were, the picture is a bit unclear, this is the one from the paper, uh, but if they were asked to pick up the marker, that people were actually distracted and they were looking at the picture of a stamp, which was here, I think, or was it that one, I don't remember, uh, because uh, the Russian translation for the English word stamp uh, is marku, right? So, uh, to Marion and colleagues, this was evidence that even if people were listening in English, that Russian words got activated during the experiment. They also did it the other way around, so uh, people were also asked to listen in Russian, or Mimi Marku, and then she observed that people were actually looking at the picture of the mark. So if they got Russian input, they were looking at the English word, and if they got English input, they were distracted by uh, the Russian word. Uh, this was replicated by, uh, by Wiebelan and Cutler uh, in Nijmegen, which Dutch English bilinguals, in which people were asked uh, to listen to sentences like this, pick up the desk and put it on the circle. And so if people were listening to the word, so this is auditory word recognition, uh, were listening to the word, desk, they were actually looking at a picture of a Dutch word, uh, Daxel, because the onset is shared. Right? This isn't a very easy experiment, but it shows that if people are listening in a second language, that also words from the first language get active. Yeah. Mackin and colleagues found the effect both in L2 auditory word recognition and in L1 auditory word recognition. Uh, and Cutler only found the effect in uh, L2. There was also another interesting study by Yu and Lucci with English Spanish bilinguals who actually uh, replicated <coughs> this effect, but they only got the effect if, uh, and here it, participants were English Spanish bilinguals, if the Spanish target, so this was L2 recognition, were artificially manipulated to contain English VOT times, voice onset times. Right? So here you only got the cross-lingual effect if the Spanish sounded a bit English-wise. Right? So they did uh, tiny uh, artificial acoustic uh, manipulations, and if it was Spanish with an English accent, you found that English words got active, uh, and if that wasn't the case, uh, they didn't get so this all suggests that subphonemic cues indeed influence, at least in the auditory domain, the degree of cross-lingual interactions. Uh, and this led to our uh, auditory word recognition um, line, uh, in which we 
I especially wanted to use a different paradigm because I'm not a big fan of this visual word paradigm because I think it's never clear whether the activation that you observe actually comes from the recognition of the stimulus of the of the word or rather results from the pictures from the visual display uh, that you uh, are seeing. And also I wanted to investigate, I was intrigued by the uh, experiment of you and Ruchi in which the accent uh, mattered uh, or had a big influence uh, on the degree to which the other non-relevant language got active. And so I also wanted to manipulate for the first time, uh, does it matter whether the speaker is actually a native English speaker or whether he has uh, an accent. And so we developed a series of experiments which were all uh, very similar. Our first study was about L2 auditory word recognition. We had the same bilinguals. Um, this time this is auditory, so we didn't use eye tracking. We used a simple L2 lexical decision task. We had two speakers, uh, a Dutch native speaker speaking English, so as I am uh, now, and also we also had an English uh, native speaker which was living in Belgium for 15 years, but uh, which uh, still very much uh, sounded like the Oxford Dictionary, at least to me. Um, the crucial stimuli here were interlingual homophones, so uh, we didn't use cognates here, uh, but we used words which had the same phonology, so this is an auditory word recognition experiment, across languages but not the same meaning. And an example, uh, for instance, would be the English word uh, boss, uh, the head of a company, uh, which is boss in Dutch and which means forest, right? And um, we, of, or at least it would be our hypothesis that if people hear this phonology, which has a lexical representation in both of their languages, that the semantic mismatch between the meaning of the two lexical representation would cause competition and would slow them down, would slow down recognition. At least that was our hypothesis. Um, this was an L2 auditory uh, study, so of course it was really important that our interlingual homophones were uh, matched with our controls on a number of variables, but given that this was quite an unbelievable effect, which I will show uh, in a minute, uh, the reviewers made us do monolingual controls, uh, of course, in order to make sure that the effect was really about bilingual. So we also needed monolinguals, we couldn't find them in Belgium, but thanks to Dennis we could find them here in uh, South uh, Hampton. So um, then the stimuli, the interlingual homophone sounded uh, like this. So for the English native speaker, boss sounded like boss. Leaf. leaf, which in Dutch sounds like leaf. Boss. Yeah, so you can clearly hear the difference between the Dutch native speaker and the English native speaker. So boss by an English native speaker is this. So you can hear the difference, but of course it's the same phoneme, so we thought that uh, would be enough to get the effect. That's exactly what happened. So this is L2 auditory word recognition. First time showing the results of the Dutch uh, speaker. Uh, we presented these materials to the Southampton students and they didn't get an effect. So that shows that our homophones were really well matched. Uh, we almost got exactly the same uh, RT. Uh, so the Southampton students did not show an interlingual effect, but the bilinguals, the Dutch English bilinguals, were slower to recognize the homophones, which is the lighter bar here, than to recognize the homophones. We got this effect with the Dutch uh, speaker, so you can say, well, of course, it's plausible because it's a Dutch speaker, she has a Dutch accent, uh, so maybe that's the reason why the Dutch got active during the English recognition experiment. So here are the data from the English speaker, and basically we found exactly the same. No effect for the Southampton students, which shows that the materials uh, were well matched, but for the bilinguals, again, we found the really homophobic. Well, is that like a almost extreme data effect size? Uh, this one is actually quite big, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Here it was, yeah, it was similar. Uh, in the visual domain, people have also done uh, um, experiments with the visual analogs of homophones, which are then homographs, which are written the same uh, across languages but with different meaning. And in those experiments for homographs, you, you also find a very 
completely perforated. So if people have to do lexical decision, and then suddenly they see a string, and they have to respond no to English words, and they, suddenly they, they, they found a string which exists in English, you also get huge English. But you're right, it's a bit of um, Yeah, I don't have a, a clear explanation for that. Um, this is the next experiment in which we did exactly the same, but this time participants were asked uh, to recognize words not in their second language, but in their native language. So this is a one auditory word recognition. We had the same homophones uh, pronounced by the same uh, speakers. But now, of course, they were supposed to be part of a Dutch experiment, so the pronunciation was a bit different. For the Dutch native uh, speaker, this sounded like speaker. So you know that you can notice that she can speak Dutch but it's still with an English accent. For the English native speaker pronouncing boss. Boss. So I think the difference is clear. Um, these are the results for this experiment. This time uh, it's recognition in Dutch in a one so we couldn't <coughs> get any monolingual so I don't have that here. Uh, of course, it's the same stimuli as in the L2 experiment in which we showed that with the monolinguals uh, you didn't get the effect. So here in the same graph you see the results for L1 auditory word recognition pronounced by the Dutch native speaker and pronounced by the English speaker and in both cases and you will see that the effect is actually uh, quite similar. We got the interlingual so people are listening to this string, it creates activation in their lexicon, both in the Dutch and in the English lexical representation. They have to do a language specific lexical decision task, uh, and the competition between the two meanings of the interlingual homophones is uh, in the yeah. um, Again, these are all uh, isolation experiments, so uh, then we had to start the work right from the isolation experiment. Uh, we also asked the question here, just as in the visual domain, what happens when uh, you put uh, the words in a linguistic and semantic coherent context, uh, sentences, is that used as a cue to modulate non-target language activation. So we basically uh, we ran all these experiments with the same bilinguals, again in L2 and in L1 uh, listening, uh, pronounced by a native and a non-native speaker, and here again we had the low and the high constraint sentences, so we also uh, manipulated sentence constraints. So we know too that the sentence, the low constraint uh, sentence, uh, would sound like, and here the critical target is cow, which is a homophone of the Dutch word cow, co, actually, so it's not, it's not a, very, a very good example. The, the Dutch equivalent would be cow, so it sounds like this. So that was the Dutch speaker, you can hear that she has a Dutch accent. And so the Oxford lady did it like this. There was only one farm. Oh, no, 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 that's also the Dutch There was only one farm and able to know that cow. There was a lot of damage because of this terrible cow. So you can hear clearly the speaker effect. Uh, you see the difference between the low constraint and the high constraint sentences. And we had the L1 condition in this experiment, and we also had the Sorry, and we also had the one condition. Okay, so I think the design is clear. Uh, here you can see the results. First, I'm showing the results for a two auditory uh, word recognition. Uh, so this is an English L2 lexical decision task. So people had to react to the last word of the sentence. Uh, with the Dutch speaker, we found the interlingual homophone effect for the low constraint sentences and also for the high constraint sentences. Uh, here you see the results for the English speaker, again an effect for low and high constraint. The star is missing here, but this effect was also uh, significant. So it doesn't really matter whether there's an accent in there. You still get activation uh, from the other language. These are the results for L1 auditory word recognition. So these are people listening in their native language. Again, uh, strong effect in low constraint sentences. Uh, and in high constraint sentences, and these are the effects um, in a one auditory word recognition. Uh, so Dutch lexical decision talk, this 
the decision task with the English speaker. And here, this is the only non effect that we got. Here in the high constraint centers, uh, we didn't get the effect anymore. Um, how am I doing time wise? Not too good, I feel. A little bit, right? You got 30 minutes. So, to conclude this auditory uh, line of research, we also did a replication of the visual world study um, that I explained earlier. Uh, because we were a bit puzzled by the fact that Manning and colleagues found the effect both in native language recognition uh, with their immersed Russian English bilinguals, uh, whereas Weber and Cutler only found it in L2. Uh, and that was a bit contrasting with our experiments, in which we always found uh, surprisingly big effects in all conditions across constraint uh, manipulations and across uh, speakers. So uh, we decided also to do one of these visual world studies again, uh, also to rule out the fact that there was something special about uh, the homophones. Uh, so we replicated the visual world paradigm with natural language sentences. So this all is, a, is also a sentence study. Uh, and we had the same manipulation as, uh, as Weaver and Ann Cutler, in which people were listening to targets like flower, and um, if they had to listen to the word flower, we investigated whether they were distracted by a uh, Dutch word, which has the same onset, in this case, the word uh, flesh. Yeah. This experiment we only did with the English native speaker. These are the results of this study. So first, you can see the results for L2 auditory word recognition. So these are Dutch English bilinguals listening to English sentences. And here you can see the eye tracking or the eye movements um, as, it, as they develop over time. And the red line here is a competitor. So in this case, they are listening to the tool, to English, so they are listening to the sentence. That man finally got a flower. And so the green line, uh, no, the red line here, um, indicates whether they are distracted by the Dutch word with the same onset. And so, uh, if the onset is exactly the same, like in the, in the critical pair flower and flesh, uh, we found a significant uh, effect here. And if the phonological overlap was also existing, but uh, a bit less clear, I mean, in the case flower and flesh, the onset is phonologically exactly the same. Here in curtain and uh, cousin, it's the same phonemes, but it's not exactly the same. They are allophonic. Uh, variations, we also got the effect. Right? So that means that even though they were listening in English, the Dutch word again became active. These are the results for L1 recognition. So now these are Dutch English bilinguals listening to Dutch sentences. Here, if the onset was exactly the same, like in the pair flash flower, we observed the distracted effect. So just as, uh, as we even covered it. But if the phonological overlap between languages was less than perfect, like in the pair cousin curtain, we didn't get the effect anymore. Which basically uh, also explains the discrepancy between the Weber study and the Marion study, because um, the Weber study all had stimuli uh, like this, in which there was some phonological overlap, but it wasn't perfect. And in the Russian study, the overlap was. So basically, here we are showing that you get this, these cross-lingual lexical interactions. Uh, but if, if you're not talking about homophones, which share um, an entire phonology, uh, the system is actually quite sensitive to the amount, to the degree of lexical overlap. So from all auditory experiments, we can conclude um, we found an interlingual homophone effect in all these studies in auditory recognition and a distracted effect in the visual word paradigm, which means that also in the auditory domain, people do not use the acoustic cues that are uh, present uh, in utterances, in, uh, in speech, uh, to restrict or to guide lexical search towards a single lexicon. We found this effect always uh, for both speakers, so it didn't really matter whether you get input by a native language speaker or by a uh, foreign language speaker, as I am. Uh, we also got it in the native language, so also if you're listening in your native language, it appears that you get lexical activation in uh, lexical representations of a second language. Um, and again, our bilinguals um, 
are quite good in English. Uh, I mean, uh, they can't understand uh, text, they can speak as I can, but they are definitely not uh, immersed by English. People are living in an English context all the time, they are uh, unbalanced by English. And we found these effects in low and high constrained sentences, which shows that the linguistic and the semantic context provided by sentences does not really uh, have the power to make the system uh, language specific. Um, okay, I don't know whether I have time for this because I have the feeling that I have been speaking for a while now. speaking for 50 minutes or five if you want to. Okay, uh, I, I was going to end with, with one small experiment. This will uh, go really fast. I just uh, want to point out that by now these cross lingual lexicons. Lexical interaction effects, we got uh, a bit tired of them, although we were very happy with the results, of course. Uh, but also uh, a bit surprised by the fact that we got these lexical cross lingual interaction effects all the time. Um, and in the bilingual psycholinguistic literature, this has led to a bit of a standstill uh, because people were actually uh, doing a lot of the same paradigms and the same cognitive effects uh, uh, all the time. And, um, it is only quite recently, I'm saying 2010 here, but it's probably a bit uh, more recent uh, even. Uh, the field of bilingualism after these first um, spectacular studies which shows that both languages are always active at, at the same time and has moved to new questions. And one of these new questions is the question about uh, how is it possible if it's indeed the case that bilinguals uh, have two active languages all the time, and these languages are all constantly interacting. Uh, if that's the case, uh, then why uh, do people make uh, so few errors? I mean, I have been uh, speaking here for an hour now, and apart from my stimuli, I haven't uh, erroneously uh, produced uh, a Dutch word uh, in my speech stream, so how is that possible? It must be the case that bilinguals have quite a good cognitive control system, to handle this constant competition across languages. And that's actually the main question, at least in my impression, uh, what the field is targeting now. There's some very exciting research which has shown that uh, bilinguals, due to the uh, repeated practice with the competition between, due, between uh, two languages, uh, actually develop a very good language control system, which is the same system that is used in non-linguistic cognitive and by now there are uh, quite a number of indications, mostly from a group led by Alec Bialystok in Canada, but also Albert Costa in Barcelona, which shows that bilinguals actually outperform monolinguals on measures of uh, not language control, but non-linguistic non uh, executive control. So the things that uh, are assessed by Simon Taft, so you have to press right if the uh, if the, the arrow uh, is presented on the right, but it's presented on the left side of the screen. So these kinds uh, of congruency effects. And bilinguals perform better in these tasks than uh, monolinguals. This has been found in uh, students, in children, uh, and in elder uh, people. Yeah. So I've always heard about this stuff, but is it worthwhile? Or is it something they got specifically significant? Like is it, I was always wondering about like, is it just like something the color that if you run enough people you can get it, but it yeah. doesn't really make a difference for the task itself? Exactly. Uh, it also got us a little bit suspicious because it was always the same group who, who came out with this effect, and more specifically uh, the group from Canada led by Alan Bialystok, and also uh, more recently uh, the Barcelona guys, which is a very specific kind of bilingualism because there they are switching between Catalan and Spanish uh, all the time. Uh, so we thought, ah, is it a statistical fluke or maybe is it a feature of the very specific type of bilinguals uh, that they have? And then uh, a very important paper came out by Kenneth Papp in Cognitive Science in which he uh, replicated these studies in 10 or 11 experiments and he compared monolinguals with bilinguals in San Francisco and in none of the 11 experiments he could replicate the bilingual advantage effect. Right? So that created <coughs> kind of a buzz, uh, mystery in the literature. Um, and also that sparked uh, our interest, um, and that's the reason for the last and tiny experiment uh, that I will present today. Uh, we thought, well, maybe it's the amount of switching. If we looked at the participants of Kenneth Park who couldn't find the bilingual advantage, and other people couldn't find it either, uh, those were people who were really good bilinguals, uh, like Dennis would be, because by now he's very fluent 
uh, in English. But what Dennis doesn't do is switching between Dutch and English all the time, right? He speaks English uh, to you guys, and he speaks Dutch to me or to his parents, so he doesn't switch. And that's different for the Bialystok bilinguals, uh, the Canadians, who switch uh, between English and French all the time, uh, speaking to the same people in the same context. And that's definitely true for the Barcelona guys, uh, who sometimes switch between Catalan and Spanish uh, within specific uh, sentences. So he said, well, um, can we found uh, this bilingual advantage effect uh, in Ghent? Uh, and maybe can we find an explanation for the difference between the null effects in PAR and the significant effects in the Alistair? One problem that we had in Ghent is that we don't have any monolinguals. So basically, we couldn't test any, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so our uh, answer to this question is, by necessity, uh, very incomplete. Uh, but we did it in another way. What we did was comparing not monolinguals with bilinguals, but we compared unbalanced Dutch-French bilinguals, as I am, with balanced Dutch-French bilinguals, so who would rate proficiency equally uh, for the two languages. And we had two groups of balanced bilinguals. We had balanced bilinguals that don't switch, so these are guys who, for instance, speak French at work and who speak Dutch at home. So, um, they are equally proficient in both languages, but they, they don't use the two languages interchangeably, so that would be Dennis. Um, and we also have balanced Dutch French bilinguals that do code switch. So these are guys from Brussels who indeed uh, may start off a sentence in Dutch and end it in uh, French. It's not as, uh, as pronounced as in Barcelona, for instance, but they are uh, way different uh, than these guys. Um, Unfortunately, we couldn't do a monolinguals here, so uh, really on the basis of the bilingual advantage effect, we can't say anything. We also controlled for intelligence. I think that's a huge uh, lack in the Bialystok studies. All these bilingual advantage studies, they never control for intelligence. And of course, we know that intelligence correlates highly with executive control, so I think that is really an important short point. Kenneth Paal, who found the null effects on the bilingual advantage, he did control for intelligence. So um, that gives a little bit more confidence in his results. Um, we had two executive control tasks here, the flanker task. So you have to react to the direction of the middle arrow. Uh, and then uh, the arrows which are around the critical target are either congruent, as in uh, these two displays, or either incongruent, as in these displays. In the Simon task, you have to react uh, to the direction of uh, the arrow, and in the congruent trials, um, that direction is also the side of the screen that the stimulus is displayed on, and in the incongruent trials, so you have to press right because it's a right arrow, because it, it's displayed on the left side uh, of the display, so that's an incongruent uh, trial. Uh, here are some characteristics uh, of our bilinguals. So here you can see that these are our balanced bilinguals are both. Uh, very early bilinguals, so they started learning the two languages very early in life, around age uh, one. They also have uh, similar proficiency levels, so they are equally proficient uh, in French, or almost equally proficient. But the big difference is here, uh, the frequency of switching, so the number of days in which you use both languages regularly uh, within the same context, that was uh, different for the balanced switching bilinguals than for the here are the results. Again, no monolinguals. We only have the different bilinguals here. And here, uh, our results are a bit more in line with those of PAP. Namely, we couldn't get the difference in the flanker effect, so as a measure of cognitive control, between unbalanced and balanced bilinguals. Right? So we don't, I don't have a monolingual bar here. Uh, but at least this suggests that being a very proficient bilingual, which probably has effects on language control, doesn't really do anything for the flanker. But in the group that often switches, we found a congruency effect that was significantly smaller than in these groups. So apart from these data, it's not really the proficiency that matters to develop a, uh, an executive control <coughs> advantage. It's rather the amount of uh, switching. Here you can see the same graph, but here you have the congruent and the incongruent conditions. And this is just the conflict effect, so you can see that these groups uh, have exactly the same conflict effect, and these bilinguals have a small conflict. In the Simon task, uh, the data are a bit less neat. In fact, for the balanced bilinguals, we, we found a big, uh, 
a bit bigger conflict effect here that wasn't significant though, I think it was 0.12 or something uh, like that. But what we did find is for this group, uh, this conflict effect was significantly smaller than for this group. So I can't really say anything on the basis of this data about the difference with monolingus, but uh, at least the comparison uh, between these three groups uh, shows that maybe the discrepancy between the Bialystok and the Costa group and the PAL null effects could have something to do with the amount of uh, switching and that bilinguals only develop the executive control advantage if in fact uh, they switch off. Okay, let me wrap up. Uh, I realize that I have shown a big number of experiments. Um, I think I will have convinced you that, of, uh, I hope I will have convinced you that lexical candidates from both languages are always activated, both in visual and auditory word recognition, both in isolation and in sentence context, uh, whether these sentences are semantically constraining or not, whether they are in L2 or in the native language. Uh, there is some variation in the size of our uh, effect, uh, but it seems to be the case that it's always uh, quantitative variations as a function of the semantic constraint of the sentences, and the system never qualitatively changes into a language selective system. Um, this suggests that there should be a very limited uh, role for top-down connections in models of uh, bilingual word recognition, so top-down top connections with which uh, could shut down one language while you're reading in the other language or in the other learning domain uh, while you're uh, listening uh, into um, another language. Uh, and this is where the field of bilingualism uh, is now. Uh, we have this bunch of data mostly within the same kind of paradigms indicating lexical interactions, but these models uh, we don't actually have and that will be uh, the next challenge uh, for the field to develop more explicit hopefully computational models uh, that may model uh, these effects. Okay, I'm gonna uh, stop here. I had some other slides, but I knew that I had way too much. Uh, so I just only want to thank the people who are uh, involved in this research. That's it. Thank you. it will be the control advantage because now I didn't uh, talk about these studies but there are actually now even studies, uh, picture naming studies in which they are comparing the speed by which a monolingual can name a picture of a boat and a bilingual and a bilingual is indeed slow but of course the clear advantage is, is that you can speak all the time. but computationally it makes things a lot harder because your brain has way more information to represent and also to process so you can express yourself in more languages but it, it slows you down have they ever done that with trilinguals then but the slow down should be more pronounced no no we have uh, of course most of our bilinguals actually do have knowledge of a third language of french but we never explicitly compared uh, bilinguals with trilinguals we, we haven't done also because pure bilinguals would also be will have knowledge of three or four languages. So all the differences in expertise in the second language, mm -hmm. if people are kind of learning it or um, you know, mediocre in it or really fluent in it, does that affect the problem? De definitely. In our data set I can't really answer that because I'm always testing a very homogeneous group of bilinguals. I mean it's the students who come to our university and they speak English uh, like Dennis and I do, and they are quite proficient, I think you can say, even though we learned like English uh, quite late, but they are quite homogeneous. But at least some of our effects, at least the effects in L1, uh, other people didn't get, right? So, uh, for instance, uh, the effect when reading in your native language, uh, that effect um, some people didn't get with lower proficiency by language. 
But of course, that's the trouble with the bilingual field is that you have so many variables. Uh, you have different patterns of language use. How often do you use a language? At what age did you learn it? Do you use it in different contexts? And immediately your replication across labs always implies a big difference also in the language use parameters. Right? So I'm sure it has a big effect. Um, I can only say that in our bilinguals it's a highly aselective system. Uh, and it's one system. And it's one system. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's also what uh, we find in neuroimaging studies. It's mostly the same uh, neural structure. But of course, it also has to do with the, the spatial resolution of the system, right? I mean, maybe if you have better scanners in, uh, uh, I don't know, in, in 30 years' time, uh, it will still be different uh, group, groups of neurons. Uh, uh, because, of course, I can only say with these cognitive effects that they are functionally interacting, but it could still be a spatially separate group of neurons which just has very strong connections. studies with different scripts like the Arabic study that you're running is so interesting. Yeah. It, it could be the case that it, that it works very differently. There, there is a study by Tamar Golan and Ralph Frost with Hebrew-English bilinguals in which some of the translations, so we also did some translation priming studies, uh, so cat primes the Dutch word uh, cat. And in those studies with Hebrew-English bilinguals, they didn't find priming of L2 on L1. Okay. Yeah. And they attribute that to the fact that uh, the bilinguals have different schools. So of course it's an important variable and it, it may matter. So of course our data only speak for Dutch English bilinguals which are quite similar languages with lots of comments. I mean, I mean you could say in our case it really pays off uh, to allow lexical activation in the other lexicon because a lot of the words that you will see will be cognates, right? Uh, in languages in which the ratio of cognates uh, smaller, uh, it will be more efficient uh, to work um, with a more selective system. Yeah. Yeah. So, did you actually add the findings to the script text that showed that um, bilinguals um, show a reduced script effect? Yes, that has been found. We haven't done that, but Alan Bialystok has a bunch of PhD students testing bilinguals and monolinguals on all cognitive control tasks that exist, and one of them is the Stroop task, and she did find that bilinguals so show a smaller stroop effect. Does it depend which language the words are in? In both languages, if I remember correctly. It's smaller than L2, so the effect is smaller than L2 anyway, but even then, um, it didn't interact with the bilingual environment, so it was smaller for bilinguals than for 